Christ. Hello everyone, good afternoon, thanks for coming. Welcome to Maine Law. We see a lot of new faces. I'm Dave Sorens with the Federalist Society. And uh, this is Amy Olfine with the Health, Care, Health Law Association. And she will introduce our two debaters today. It should be a good debate. It's a very important piece of legislation. We thank you all for coming down. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, we're very excited today. We have um, two wonderful medical experts on this issue, which has been one of the most controversial and complicated pieces of legislation we've had in the legislation we've passed that time. Uh, with us today, uh, to the far right, is, um, is Bill Alabaugh. He is with the Heritage Policy Center, and he is the director for the Center of, for Health Reform. Excuse me. He has a wonderful bio and background. Um, including uh, putting the host of Inside on the Healthcare by Local Color in the program, a two-time president of the Board of Directors for the Association of Health um, Underwriters, and a member of the main coalition for, to protect patient rights. And then to my left here uh, is Garrett Martin, who is the executive director of the um, May Center for Economic Policy. The, he is also um, a member of the Maine Community Development Advisory Committee for the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston and has a master's degree from um, Princeton University. I'm going to hand it over to Joel to give a background on this piece of legislation and give us kind of a, a brief overview of the, the main elements of it. Um, everyone can hear me okay? So this law which was passed this past May, there are multiple components to it. You heard in the introduction that it's um, one of the more complex bills. So real high level, some of the key components were making changes to Maine's community rating laws, which has to do with um, how much an insurance company can vary a rate from one person to the next. We uh, have restrictive community rating laws in the state, and um, part of what this law attempted to do, to do was get in line with the Affordable Care Act, the federal reform law that was passed. So there were changes in the amount that an insurance company can vary a rate from one person to the next based on age. Uh, there was also some differences in how rates can be varied based on geography. Uh, I assume you are probably aware that there are differences in cost of services wherever you happen to be receiving them in the state. Um, the law also created a health insurance captive for the first time under Maine statute, which has to do with um, a closed group, uh, specifically this is driven by a group of employers that, that want to essentially uh, take a stab at managing their, their health care a little bit differently as a, as a collective group <coughs> the law enables them to perform. Um, allows uh, in the future for shopping across state lines, so oftentimes you may hear people compare Maine's premiums to our neighbors next door in New Hampshire, so the uh, one provision of the law allows people in the state of Maine to buy health insurance from carriers that are outside of the state, uh, specifically with some of our neighboring states. Um, also creates um, a wellness tax credit for small businesses. So a lot of larger companies that uh, manage health care costs will make investments for employee wellness, sort of put the dollars on the front end to you know avoid the big ticket items from happening to begin with. Smaller companies, it's a much uh, more difficult decision for a small employer to make those investments. They don't see the return in the same way uh, that a large employer would. So this tax credit uh, is designed to encourage more small employers to, um, to make investments in employee wellness. Um, and also some changes to Rule 850, which, which is a Bureau of Insurance rule, which has to do with how insurance companies set up their networks. You may be familiar from an insurance plan being an in-network provider versus an out-of-network provider. And we have some very specific rules about how far, uh, what the traveling distance could be from, let's say, a primary care physician or from a specialist. And there were some changes made to that rule. Um, the intention is so that insurance companies can have the ability to offer what we call in the industry tiered networks. Um, you may see this. Uh, I'll give you a practical example. The state of Maine uses this for state uh, employees where they may say, you know, here are the specialists for this particular service within our network, and these particular specialists with the star next to their name we've identified as being higher quality, potentially providing services at a lower cost, and they may incent the person to see those particular designated folks, which could be 
you know, your deductible is $100, but it's $200 if you go to someone who's non-preferred versus preferred. Um, am I forgetting any? I think those are the main elements. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. I just wanted to make sure that everybody kind of had some background before we started the debate. And then uh, right now we're going to start. Uh, Lisa Paler is a one out here at uh, Main Law. She's going to be facilitating the debate and just give some background. She is a neutral figure. She doesn't belong to either organization, but she does have extensive experience in the field of insurance. So we're, we're, we're excited to have her and her experts with us. Um, so I'm our first question is starting. Proponents of Public 190 claim that everyone will see lower health insurance rates as a result of the law. Do you agree with this contention? So we're not doing opening statements. Well, uh, I apologize. Uh, you can go. <laughs> I'm happy to answer the question that's stated. Um, you know what, Garrett? Whatever you're most comfortable with. If you really just, if you'd like to start with a, an opening statement first, and then we'll go into questions. So, sure. Time. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. I don't want to screw up the expectations here. Um, and, and I just want to say before I dive in, I recognize you're here because of the free food. Um, so enjoy it, and hopefully we won't mess it up too much for you. But I, I do think it's important to give an opening statement from Parker because that was my expectation, and um, Joel and I like to set set the table first if we can. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in and, I, and, and share some, some preliminary thoughts, and we'll go deeper on some of these things as, as we get into the discussion. The first thing you need to know is that the new this new insurance law is no solution. Um, it fails to address a real problem, which is the rising cost of health care for everybody. In this country, we spend twice as much on health care as any other developed country in the world, and our outcomes are worse. Our life expectancy is lower here than it is in Cuba. This is an example. Um, until we get a handle on that, we are no better off. Effectively, we're just shifting the deck chairs on a sinking ship. This insurance law cuts both ways. If you allow those who are younger and as I look in this room, most of you all can benefit in some way potentially from this and live in better served areas of the state to pay less than those who are older and live in other parts of the state will pay more. While the reinsurance program, and we'll get into this later, lessens these discrepancies in the individual market, there's no such mechanism for the small group market. And that's an important thing to bear in mind. We're going to talk about the individual market and the small group market. The individual market represents about 35,000 people. The small group market represents about 100,000 people. So we'll, we'll make that distinction later but basically many small businesses are in for a rude awakening when they get their rates and we're already seeing that in Washington County we've, we've got a business that's seen its rates go up 90 percent the insurance law will likely have a disproportionate impact on rural residents and communities not only because of the ratings issues but also due to the possible introduction of incentives for people to seek care elsewhere and you don't have to take my word for this dr. Eric Steele who's the chief medical officer of Eastern Maine health health care systems wrote an op-ed appropriately titled gutting Maine's health care system that appeared in the Bangor Daily News. In it, he writes, and I quote, cutting off the rules that protect Maine's health insurance market from increased competition could shred the financial stability of Maine's rural hospitals. The insurance rule changes in LD 1333 almost certainly will threaten the ability of those hospitals to hold Maine's rural health care delivery system together. That's serious stuff. While it has yet to be seen how these rules will take effect, in the rush to foster competition, and I use that term loosely because healthcare markets are not competitive markets. Anytime you have a situation where someone has a choice between death and life, you think they're going to be rational actors in how they price something? Proponents seem incapable or unwilling to acknowledge the potential unintended consequences of such actions to consider other solutions that could have achieved their stated objective of lowering health care costs for all. This issue also points to a flaw in our delivery system, highlighted by Dr. Steele. To stay afloat, rural hospitals find themselves in the un unenviable position of subsidizing less profitable and routine activities, such as office visits and preventive care, with more costly diagnostic procedures. And Dr. Dr. Uh, Steele has a great graphic that shows in Blue Hill, at Blue Hill Memorial Hospital, the only thing keeping that hospital afloat is joint replacements. If you take away their ability to do joint replacements, everything else that they deliver, primary care, preventive care, all that stuff, they can't make money on. So the, the incentives are all out of whack. Lastly, the insurance law gives more power and profits, and this is a key point, to insurance companies. These companies have more power than ever to influence where a patient gets care and potentially do so based on cost alone. 
Now, Joel referenced the state employee health plan that was cited as a model for this or a justification for it. But what, what was not stated is that in the case of the employee health plan, it's based on quality alone. That was the starting premise. It's now based on quality and cost. And under this law, it can be based solely on cost. So you can be directed to go get care someplace else, even if the quality is lower. The reinsurance program effectively subsidizes the risk for insurers in the individual market. This actually erodes the incentives for insurers to do what they should be doing in the first place. Think about this. You're basically giving insurance companies a pass on having any responsibility for high cost patients. And so rather than encouraging them to pool people, spread risk, negotiate better rates with providers and reward better care and results, they basically are getting a free ticket. Further evidence of the power being given to insurance companies is the fact that of the 11 members that will serve on the reinsurance board, five are appointed by insurers. Talk about letting the fox guard the in house. Five out of 11, only takes one more. Of course, the biggest giveaway is the elimination of rate review in the individual market. This should be of concern for everybody in this room. Rate review has been a very effective tool for consumers in moderating and rate increases. During the most recent review, Anthem proposed a 10% increase, actually it's 9.7% increase in individual rates. Under the new law, this would have been granted pro forma, no problem. What rate review allowed for is a capping of that increase to 5.2%. So I'm hard pressed to see how eliminating rate review that benefits many people. In conclusion, I just want to say the intent of this law is justified. I think Joel and I both agree. Healthcare costs are out of control. I think any of you all have tried to purchase healthcare know that. Um, but all main people should have access to affordable quality healthcare. Unfortunately, this law falls short of that goal and gives up too much. At the end of the day, the ship is still sinking. We're simply shifting the deck chairs, and we need to fix the leaky ball. So that's my opening. Thank you. Since I now have an opening, I'm going to get it. Um, I think I, I, I'm going to agree and disagree in, in some different areas. And I, where I'm going to agree is that our healthcare system clearly has some pretty significant issues that need to be addressed. And not all of it's going to be addressed with this law because the underlying cost of care is an issue. But you have to separate our healthcare challenges from our health insurance regulations because they are not one and the same. Health insurance is how most of us choose to finance our health care, and it simply reflects the underlying cost of the services. It's not the demon itself, it just reflects it. So we can spend all day long debating the underlying insurance laws, and we're essentially focusing on the symptom rather than the root cause. So there clearly are some root issues to be dealt with here. But I'll say this, you have to have a little bit of historical perspective. Back in the early 90s, we made some pretty significant changes to our healthcare markets here in the state of Maine. And we became a very significant outlier in the state of Maine compared to the rest of the country. And if you think that your healthcare costs are high in the state of Maine, you're absolutely right. And if you compare them against other states, we have some of the highest rates in the nation. We sort of <coughs> oscillate between being the highest and maybe being the third highest. And there's a reason for it. When we talk about the community rating laws, for example, they allow an insurance company to vary a rate from a young person to an old person by no more than 1.5 to 1 or 150%. So put that into perspective. I'm going to charge a 20-year-old $100 a month for a policy. Then I can charge that 60-year-old $150 for the same policy. It's also helpful to be aware that Older people consume more health care than younger people, as we would all expect. Actuarially, they consume about five times as much. So if you go to an actuary who's just a number cruncher at the insurance company and say, price this policy so it accurately reflects the risk, then they would want to price the six-year-old policies five times as much as the 20-year-old. The concept and the goal that Maine was trying to achieve was to say, look, we want the rate for the 60-year-old to come down, the rate for the 20-year-old to come up, we'll meet somewhere in the middle, we'll all pay the 40-year-old rate. But you have to understand in the insurance market, there is always a balance to be struck. And if you look at what happened in, this, in the Maine market from these reform laws, our insurance markets have been shrinking ever since. And it's what they call the death spiral. And you heard that the individual insurance market has about 35,000 people covered in it today. That's an accurate statement. But back at the time of these reforms, it was more than double that. And it's just continued 
to get smaller and smaller. Insurance is about spreading risk. And I would just ask you, who do you think drops their coverage first? Do you think it's the 20-year-old who has no expectation of seeing a doctor, or do you think it's going to be the 60-year-old who has four medications and needs to see the doctor every, every couple of months? Well, if you compare Maine and New Hampshire today, and this was, this was uh, an illustration in the, uh, while this was being debated for the legislature, Anthem illustrated that in Maine and New Hampshire, where they're, major, uh, they're a major insurance player, if they look at their 18 to 24 year old category for individual insurance, they insure less than 300 people that fall into that age group in the state of Maine compared to about 1,700, uh, close to 1,800 in New Hampshire. So we've had this dynamic where our insurance markets, and I would, I would say well-intentioned uh, rule changes designed to try to stabilize the rates have had the opposite effect. Our costs have gone up precipitously ever since. I should mention I'm an insurance broker by trade, so you heard the bio, you didn't hear that. I deal with employers and their insurance uh, policies on a daily basis. And the costs have gone up because of the way in which we've structured our regulations. So part of what this law tries to do is strike that balance. How do you set a market up that effectively spreads the risk but also encourages everybody along the age spectrum to participate. All right. <laughs> Mr. Martin, the proponents of Public Law 90 claim that everyone will see lower health insurance rates as a result of the law. Do you agree with this contention? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Uh, can you pull up the slide? I think this is the most important point to discuss because when you heard, first of all, to give some context, um, when this law was being debated, it went from a four-page proposal to a full-scale 44-page document in less than nine days. You know how long it took the legislature to decide the status of the whoopie pie <laughs> as the state treat or state dessert? 56 days. So major, major, major changes. And the arguments for this bill Really, the assumptions were never that well understood. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the quick premise. This is basically the status quo, and as Joel suggested, the 1.5 to 1 ratio. The max would be 528, and the minimum is 352. The average, for the sake of this depiction, is at 440. So I've assumed that an equal distribution of population. We could get into the dynamics as you make it an older population, what that means, but your max and min still remain the same. So if we go to the next slide, this is what happens under 1330. <coughs> chapter 90, is the age gets taken out. It's 3 to 1. So based on age alone, you can be charged three times more than the lowest rate. And then geography is 1.5 to 1. So your total is 4.5 to 1. So what does that mean in terms of your bands? Well, on the max side, it goes up significantly, 720. On the mid side, it comes down. So there are winners and losers here, right? I'm, I'm not denying the fact that some people are going to see their rates come down. The problem is the, the statement that everybody's going to be held harmless and see their rates come down. So how do you get there? Well, there are three ways you get there. One is you get rid of the old sick people, right? You just knock them out of the pool. That drives your average down. That works better for some people. The second thing you do is you, you attract more young, healthy people into the pool, right? Again, they're basically subsidizing the older people. Now, ironically, when you spread out the brand and you allow the actuaries to price their policies based on what they're actually paying in premiums, what happens to the level of that subsidy? It diminishes. So you've got to bring in a lot more young, healthy people into the pool to actually reap a benefit from that subsidy level. So the third thing you can do is you can basically subsidize the pool. You can provide additional dollars that address your highest cost people within that existing pool. And that's effectively, on the individual market, what happened. This reinsurance program is basically a tax on all policyholders, not just individual policyholders. So $4 per <coughs> policyholder per month. And what that allows them to do is to pay for the cost of the highest cost patients within the individual market. Now note, it's only within the individual market. The amount of money that that's projected to raise is about $25 million. <coughs> The total for the individual market in terms of premiums is $150 million. Now, you all law students, not mathematicians, that's about 17%. So if you reduce your average by 17%, what happens to your max and min? Well, 
your max comes kind of close to the range, and your min goes down more significantly. That's the individual market, 35,000 people. Here's the rub. In the small group market, there is no such mechanism. And I don't know how the proponents of this bill can claim that small businesses in rural Maine with older employees are not going to see their rates go up. And in fact, the Bureau of Insurance itself had data to show that if you expanded the rate bands by 3 to 1 in Aroostook County, on average, the rate would go up by 17%. So what does that mean in terms of what the maximum level is and the minimum level? Your max goes way up relative to where you are currently. They have no mechanism for changing that. There's no mechanism within 1333 for changing that thing. Sure, your men goes down. And, and the governor was down here recently saying, highlighting the fact that a local business saw their race go down. Great for them. But what's he saying to the guys in Washington County? And in fact, I know a business in Bath that's seen its rates go up 65%. So I think it's a little disingenuous to make the claim that everyone's going to be held harmless. Because in truth, if you look at the law and you appreciate the assumptions, there is no mechanism, particularly in the small group market, for addressing that issue. Sure. Um, I actually don't completely disagree. Um, in fact, I remember saying along the way as we were debating this law that you know rates Rates are affected by multiple factors, um, especially for a small company. And rates, you know, I've been in this business for about 15 years, and if I look at the first three quarters of just this year alone, forgetting the fourth quarter, which is when the first impacts of this law took effect in the market, I saw average increases for our small business clients at about 30% average. The highest I saw in the first three quarters was 94%. I don't remember what the lowest was. I don't even think we dipped into single digits on the lowest ones. That's the status quo, by the way. And that's year after year after year after year. Um, and I never expected that, that suddenly rates would start <coughs> dropping for every one of us as soon as this law passed. It's not realistic. Um, there are still many factors. I've seen increases in the fourth quarter within our client base as well. Now, I've seen decreases, and some of them pretty substantial. That's new. I've seen increases as well, and I've seen some that are pretty dramatic. But what's different for me in the small group market versus the individual market, just dealing with it at a client level, I've got a lot of places to go. And I'll give you an example. One of our increases was close to 100% for a small company. But in looking, it wasn't related to this law. It was the fact that their workforce shrunk. And they went from an employer covering three people to an employer covering two people. And there's a very significant rating factor within the insurance company for group size. Very significant. And that's as simple as calling the employer and saying, I see you lost a person. Your renewal is reflecting a group of two. Did you refill that position? Are they going to be back on by the time the renewal takes effect? And the answer was yes. We rerun the quotes with the new person added in, and that rate increase is a totally different story. There are also a lot of things that employers can do. I told you my average increases were 30%. The average increase that an employer in our book actually absorbed was probably somewhere between 0 and 5%. Because one of the things that a small business has the advantage of is three or four insurance companies battling for their business. And so if you're doing your due diligence and you're shopping and you're looking at different plans and you're getting creative in how you structure your plan, there's a lot that a small employer can do to manage their costs from year to year, even when the insurance plan they had went up. That's one reason why I think the small business market has more opportunity to make adjustments and keep their costs in check. The individual market, I agree, they don't have that luxury. If you're an individual, there's no place else really to go. And that reinsurance pool does exactly that. It takes some of the highest cost claimants and gets them out of the equation, so to speak, and helps to bring that average down. I can tell you that in the rate hearings that happened this past spring, Anthem would uh, <coughs> disclose in those rate hearings that of their individual policyholders, and they have about half of them, of those 35,000, close to 20,000 are Anthem subscribers, that 11% of their individual policyholders spend 95% of the claim dollars. And you basically have those other folks that are all sort of absorbing what that cost is. So if you can take even a small portion of those really, really high-end claim costs and get them out of the equation, then what do you have to charge everyone else? Uh, it's pretty significant. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to 
the, market, the new law opens up Maine's health insurance market to out-of-state competition. What do you see as the pros and cons of this situation? And what do you see to be the long-term impact to Maine's health insurance markets? So this is an interesting one, because it's actually one of the key selling points of this law, is that we're going to open up the state to competition. Insurance companies from out of state are going to come in, and everybody's going to be able to achieve lower rates as a result. Let's talk about the implications of that. One, with regard to the rates and the argument that people are going to be held harmless, if you recall, one of the things I said is, in order to see your average decrease, you need to attract more young, healthy individuals into your existing pool. So if we open up the state to out-of-state out of competition, who do you think those companies want? Folks who look a lot like most of you in this room. They want the young healthies. And so, in truth, ironically, that provision within this proposal goes against the overall framework or the model for what they're trying to achieve. So that's just the sort of points out the lack of consistency in the approach of the logic. But the other issue that's a concern from a consumer standpoint is that by opening up to out-of-state competition, those companies are not regulated by Maine's Bureau of Insurance. So if you have a problem with your insurance company who happens to be based out of state, do you think that the New Hampshire Bureau of Insurance superintendent is going to have your best interest in mind? Do you think that your claim or your case is going to be rise to the top when they've got their own set of constituents to deal with? So that's one of the, the real issues. Now, in terms of the long-term implications, I think in, in truth, What's interesting from an analytic standpoint, I, I think Joel may agree with me, but I don't want to put words in his mouth, um, is that this provision actually is pretty hollow. And I mean that for two reasons. One is it doesn't kick in until 2014. It's limited to four states, companies from four states. So we're not even going to see the benefit, if there is a benefit of that, for another two years. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important for another reason. And that is because of the Affordable Care Act, which is the federal health care reform proposals, that sets the, the, the playing field more equally um, between and among states. And it just so happens that part of the reason why Maine actually has potentially some higher rates is because of the way we've approached health insurance. We've said we want to try and insure as many people as possible. And this is the way we're going to do it. Many other states haven't done that. And what does the Affordable Care Act mean for them? It means that they, their standards are coming more into line with what our standards have been historically. And so these discrepancies that get pointed out, I can guarantee you, you can get a cheaper health care plan in Mississippi. I live there, for starters, so I know that. But I can also guarantee you, you can get a much crappier health care plan in Mississippi. <laughs> and so that's the nice thing about the Affordable Care Act. I think a lot of these discrepancies that are highlighted between our rates and other states' rates, many of those are going to wash out. And that's why that particular provision, because of the way it's synced, um, is, is likely to have less of an impact. Um, it certainly wins political points. Everybody likes to say we, we created a competitive market. But from a substantive standpoint, it does very little. Yeah, I wouldn't entirely disagree. Um, you know, the, I think it's important to recognize, you know, Maine is one of four states that's more restrictive than the Affordable Care Act. So when you talk about the rest of the country sort of getting in line with Maine, that's, that's true. But remember, we're already a few steps beyond what this federal law does. And when you do have discrepancies, and the federal law, by the way, allows for plans to be sold, national plans. When you have an unlevel playing field, there's risk. There is absolutely no question that the, that the statement is correct that an insurance company wants a healthy pool of people. I mean, that's how they survive. That's how they compete with one another. So if Maine is, is very different than the Affordable Care Act, and the rest of the states are you know, at somewhat of, of level ground, we're at risk. Because you create a dynamic where it's very, very easy for me to come across the border and pick the healthy people. For example, one of the, uh, one of the provisions of this law that's getting a lot of scrutiny is the fact that geography rating, which there's always been an ability for an insurer to vary rates based on where your location is. The geography was used to be part of a composite band, and now it's sort of floating out on its own. Well, the reason it's floating out on its own is because that's exactly what the Affordable Care Act did, and there was an interest in getting Maine's laws to look more similar. 
Because if I don't do that and these national plans open up in 2014 under the federal law, well, all I got to do is is just go over and price my, my products appropriately in the in the in the more urban areas. Use that difference in keeping those vans out. I'm automatically going to look more expensive in a in a rural area than a than a main carrier, and I can just start picking off the people who are going to cost less. So there is a, a real dynamic that has to happen in terms of having some level of level playing field in order for an insurance market to actually function. And so that provision moving out to 2014, that was exactly the thinking behind it. You know, if you did it, if you did it today, there would be a real risk that an insurance company, I'll give you another example, let's say the state of Maine as an insurance company, it's a guarantee issue. I have to take anyone who applies for coverage. Let's say under another state's rules prior to the Affordable Care Act taking place, I don't have to. I can ask you health questions, and if you're sick, I can decline you, and then if you're healthy, I can take you. Well, that's great if you're that healthy person. Obviously, it's not so great if you're in the rest of us, if you will. You have to have some kind of level playing field in order for, the, in order for new competition coming in not to have a detrimental effect. And so that's really the the reason that it's, that it's 2014 and the reason why it does matter to look at what the federal law does and try to make Maine a little bit more consistent. Because again, being an outlier is not serving as well.